Well, first of all, thank you very much, especially Dimitrios, for having arranged that. Uh, Dimitrios is a, a long time ally of the <laughs> International Institute for Peace, or we are your ally, so we are <laughs> on equal terms. Mutual. And, uh, we are very happy to have uh, uh, that discussion. The, just to inform you, the International Institute for Peace is a nonpartisan, non party organization in Vienna. And we try to point or to bring the attention to some of the crisis areas, of course, especially in the neighborhood of Europe, but also beyond, uh, because our strong conviction is that peace is possible, even if it's uh, a region like yours, uh, where we have conflict for, for quite a long time. Now, uh, I welcome all the, the listeners and viewers and those who attend us. And I may just, uh, in the order I was given, uh, present our, our colleague. So we have uh, Mustafa Aydin, he's president of International Relations Council of Turkey, and he's also professor at Kadehaz University. Thank you for joining us. We have Dimitris Priantofilo, he is a director of the Center for International European Studies, Kadehaz University. He's a <coughs> organizer uh, of that event now. We have Anna Kokidis Pokopio. Uh, she is a senior fellow from Cyprus Center for Europe and International Affairs at the University of Nicosia. And we have Ahmed Sözen, Chair of the Department for Political Science and International Relations, Eastern Mediterranean University. If I'm correct, hopefully I'm correct. Uh, I'm very glad uh, we can speak about uh, the subject which is make sense, making sense of uh, developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I don't know if we can make sense of it. I hope we can make sense of it. The basic idea is that we uh, try to uh, get some glimpse, some description, definition of the crisis we have at present in the Eastern Mediterranean, but then also think about uh, what is the vital aspect because this area is, uh, has been for a long time uh, some sort of a theater <coughs> of conflicts and uh, contro controversies. So this is the basic idea. And then, of course, look into um, the future. Is a uh, future with peace or understanding or compromise possible or not? So um, maybe uh, I'm very open for the, for the direction of where we should go. Maybe, Dimitris, you start and then we go to Anna Kokidis Pocopio. Uh, I ask Dimitris because he is a, some sort of a, a hybrid uh, situation, in a hybrid situation, not you are hybrid, but the situation is hybrid. Somebody coming from Greece, teaching in uh, Istanbul, you have a bit of a wider view and you know the different sides. And then Anna, not only because she is a woman, but I think she's coming from the from the center of some of the conflicts from uh, teaching at least in a smaller country, um, an island which is, uh, which has a still a separation line, a dividing line through the island. And I just read, I think it was today that President Erdogan proposed uh, maybe to think about a two-state solution. So we forget the two-state solution in Israel, but come now to a two-state solution in Cyprus or not, but it's just uh, uh, anyway some subjects we should deal with. And then maybe Mustafa Aydin and Ahmed Sessin. Uh, I would propose about five, six, maximum seven minutes introduction. What is your orientation? And then uh, go for some you know reaction to each other and some questions which should come in. We have about uh, more than 50 participants already. so. Uh, there is an interest, and of course, we put it on the website, and uh, everybody can see it afterwards as well. Dimitrios, please. Well, Hannes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and I'd like to welcome also my co-panelists on this uh, interesting session. Um, yeah, you're putting me on the spot now, trying to talk about seven minutes about what is happening. I mean, what is happening is, is interesting. We just had an announcement a few days ago that uh, Pfizer is about to market a uh, the new the, the the you know the shot the pandemic shot to save us right uh, 
And the news in Greece was uh, incredible news. Alex Albert Burlas, the CEO of Pfizer, is Greek. He's <laughs> a Greek Jew. And it's the only thing that's played in Greece. Oh, my goodness, the Greek is out there. And the news in Turkey is that Ur Shahin and Oslem Tureci, co-founders of BioNTech, which is a German company, uh, are Turks, Turkish immigrants that have moved and uh, made a life and a name for themselves. And no one talks about the other, right? So you have a Greek-Turkish dimension. I mean, now people have started talking about it. At the beginning, it was the big news in Greece about the Greek saving the world, and in Turkey, it was about the Turks saving the world. And uh, we forget about the other dimension. And here we have a very nice example of Greek-Turkish cooperation, even though I'm sure they were not thinking of that when they were trying to develop the vaccine and, and <laughs> trying to market it, right? Um, and, and this is the state of where we are. Uh, parallel, parallel discourses. Uh, parallel discourses that have been sort of prolonged, especially this year, because we find ourselves in, 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 a, in a year, here we are, uh, on, we are mid-November, uh, the year is almost over, in uh, high tension for over a year right now. Uh, for over a year, and, and, and characteristically, because of the pandemic, uh, also high tension, in particular between Greece and Turkey, over the summer months, where usually tensions tend to go down because of tourism. And likewise in Cyprus, right? We all want the revenues of uh, Austrians such as yourself and Germans and everybody else from the world to leave their euros or dollars in our countries. Uh, and so there's some sort of moratorium in place. But this year, because of the pandemic and lack of tourism, that moratorium is not, uh, has not occurred. And so what we have is uh, high tensions, uh, the militarization of foreign policy to some extent, uh, increased threat perceptions, increased threat perceptions and lack of trust, which was all, were already there. We're already there between Greeks and Turks. And my our Cypriot colleagues will talk about Cyprus in that sense as well. Uh, and, and a realization that uh, something has to give somewhere, uh, that these uh, parallel discourses, uh, which uh, might be justified on all sides. I, I One should... Uh, and assume that uh, policymakers, whether in Athens or in Ankara or in uh, Nicosia or Lefkosa, they know, they're thinking rationally about their interests, even though each policymaker has a different status in the international arena, but they're thinking rationally about their interests and the interests of their communities, of their citizens and so on. But nevertheless, even this rationalization has been leading to increased tensions at the time, at the time of uh, what I would call systemic change, uh, where you have the emergence of the multilateral order sort of disintegrating. We are living through it, and you have the rise of a multipolar old, uh, order where, with competing poles, uh, where, whereby regional countries like Turkey uh, and others, uh, I know you had sent us a list of questions, uh, Israel or others, Egypt in, in our part of the world, are trying to be poles in this multipolar world order, but even poles within the existing multilateral order, if you think about the United States, Russia, uh, China, uh, as permanent members of the Security Council that have benefited from the multilateral order that's been in place since the Second World War, they're also acting uh, in, in, in terms of greater great power competition, so a, a greater multipolar world. And, and part of that is reflected I think in our part of the world, it's reflecting our part of the world where uh, given the <laughs> fact that uh, the, there's systemic change, given the fact that the, the one guarantor that's still the guarantor but is ambivalent about its power or its ability or its willingness to be the guarantor uh, of stability and peace in the region, the United States, um, we are not very sure wh what it wants to do. And this is not something, this has been reflected uh, very clearly during the Trump era, but it's something that started beforehand. And it's something that we are now all debating in international capitals as to what a Biden America actually means for us. Uh, and we shall see whether it means significant change, because as you've had this emergence of great power competition, uh, it also means that uh, powers, whether they are great or smaller powers, are leveraging uh, for attention, leveraging for more power in whatever world, if, if there's a sense of a return of normalcy with Biden. And so in, in this context, the Greek-Turkish tensions uh, have historical antecedents. They are not new. One can say and bring in the dimension of, of uh, 
oil and gas exploration in the Aegean. Absolutely, that's part of the. But there are historical antecedents there. Uh, uh, that that uh, and because the histories of the two countries has been forged, one has been forged by the other to a great extent. To a great extent, national holidays in Turkey reflect victories over Greeks. <laughs> Next year, Greece will be celebrating the 200th year since its independence in 1821. And uh, ceremonies are being planned, and I, uh, <laughs> I do not want to think about the content of some of the ceremonies, but they, they, how these will be reflected or or visualized. Uh, not that I want the Greeks should care; they are celebrating their history, but how they would be interpreted by the other side. Um, and 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 what you've had in this long period of of a cold peace between Greece and Turkey for uh, the 20th century, much of the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st century, it also means that uh, we've never really sat down to resolve outstanding issues, uh, outstanding issues that have to deal in particular with sovereign rights, with uh, continental shells, exclusive economic zones, um, and 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 uh, issues that have to deal with. Uh, Delimitation, where in that sense, uh, or even Greece, Greece's uh, sovereign right to extend its territorial waters in the Aegean, uh, contested uh, airspace, uh, and so on and so forth. So these issues have not really been resolved because there was a big brother, the United States, there. There was a Cold War context and the post Cold War context, which somehow kept things at bay. But now, with the with with the discoveries of hydrocarbons. Which that in itself is another discussion as to whether they are valuable anymore. I mean, we might be fighting, we might be fighting for issues that have no relevance anymore, uh, given the cost of their exploitation and whatever. But nevertheless, it's a reality until we come to a, a new sort of energy needs for our world. Um, all these issues have come come to the fore again because of competition as to under. Whose territorial waters, or whose continental shelf, or whose exclusive economic zones these belong, um, and 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 uh, and in a way, this is what has been happening. This was it's you know it's interesting. This last phase, latest phase of the conflict, basically started a year ago uh, in, with the Turkey uh, Libya memoranda, uh, but the one about the limitation in particular, which has spurred on. Greece to try to address this issue uh, as a small country and Cyprus also as a small country. How do they deal with it? They deal with it in terms of uh, you know uh, their membership in international organizations or fora such as the you know, European Union, which is by one of the things we always forget is principally made of small or very small countries. These are the members, such as your country, uh, Hannes, and, and my country, and Cyprus even more so, and and. So you know you want to ensure that your security and stability is ensured by belonging in this fora, either be it NATO if it's possible, or through international law and its application, right? Um, and, and therefore, uh, Greece has tried to strengthen its legal positions by signing the limitation agreements, uh, for example, with Italy in the Ionian Sea. That has nothing to do with Turkey per se, but it's sending a message that uh, it is wants to compromise because that's what. Uh, a delimitation agreement is a bilateral agreement. It's a product of compromise. Uh, one looks at the provisions of of what the law of the sea convention gives a country, and then on that basis compromises with its neighbor. And then a partial delimitation agreement with Egypt. Again, I think sending a message to Ankara: there are ways of dealing with some of the issues that are out there and outstanding. While it, Greece has been met with uh, with Ankara's. Uh, Strong arm tactics and and as I said, the militarization of the conflict, which means sending uh, vessels to explore or even uh, in in the case of Cyprus to uh, actually drill for oil uh, and and uh, so you know accompanied by warships and Greece has to to react. And so uh, I know I'm running out of time, right? That's what you're trying to tell me. Um, So I, I mean I'm not going to go. Maybe in, in the questions and answers we'll talk more, and maybe my colleagues will talk more. But this is the general setting, and and which means that it's been very difficult to get to the table. So from a Greek perspective, uh, what you have is a side says that you know I have to use the instruments at hand, and also the support of my allies, which is why I belong to the EU. Not only their solidarity, but their clear stated solidarity that what's at stake are sovereignty, sovereign rights, and therefore these have to be respected and protected. On the other hand, 
Ankara with which the EU is trying to find a modus vivendi. And, and I always say one should look a little bit at the Council conclusions of October, European Council conclusions of October, which is very clear as to what the EU is, how the EU is trying to deal with the situation, which is calling a respect, accepting the Greek and Cypriot positions uh, uh, also saying that Greece and Turkey should sit down to, to begin the proximity talks to, to deal with uh, issues of continental shelf and exclusive economic zones, and also presenting a positive agenda because this is part of a wider relationship with, it, with Turkey. Uh, and, and that does, has not seemed to have worked, uh, even though we all know very well that uh, to get to this council conclusions, obviously uh, Germany and other powers had spoken to Turkey, had gotten Turkey's support for this kind of conclusions, in that there would be, we would move on to another phase. But we have not been able to move on to another phase. And this has sort of, uh, you know, complicated tensions and the uncertainty, and the uncertainty which, you know, uh, has extended, has been extended, but also the uncertainty which is, is a very visual uncertainty, as shown by, by the visit yesterday of the Turkish president uh, in Cyprus, uh, and, and his very, very public visit uh, in a particular place. And so uh, this is where we are, uh, lack of trust, lack of dialogue, and I would posit also, interestingly enough, again, COVID has really, really, really destroyed us in the sense that it has had an impact on lack of, lack of dialogue uh, between societies when you cannot travel to the other side. I mean, the interaction, the immediate, I mean, it's happened in Cyprus too, where the, the crossings have closed because of COVID, uh, but, but it's happened between Greece and Turkey as well. It's a one hour flight away. I cannot fly to my country. There's only one land border crossing. Uh, the, the shipping, uh, you know, uh, joining Aegean uh, cities, uh, Turkish cities with Greek islands, that has all stopped where you had day tourists and so on come in. And so even societies do not get to talk to each other, except maybe through the wonders of Zoom and, and other applications such as these, but it's not enough. And, and so uh, even COVID has also deterred us from advancing. And actually it means that citizens uh, are basically uh, get their opinions uh, or not from their direct interaction, but from what their governments want to, to put out there. So um, I'll, maybe I'll stop here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dimitrios. Thank you for this uh, overview and reminding us about uh, 200 years of independence of Greece. And in 23, we will celebrate, or some people anyway, will certainly celebrate 100 years of uh, Ataturk's foundation of the new Turkey. Uh, also, the new Turkey of Ataturk is a bit different than what Ataturk uh, uh, wanted it to be. Anyway. Anna, I think Cyprus, in some way, one could think that Cyprus, with all this history and the domination by, by the British and Italian and the Ottomans, could play the role of mediate, of bringing people together. You have the Greek population, you have a Turkish Cypriot population. It doesn't work. In the contrary, Cyprus is in the center of a crisis. How do you see the situation? Please, Anna. Well, I'm here. Hannes, I'm a historian. Um, I was always, a, I'm always, you know, once a historian, always a historian. So I will reply, I will respond to that. Um, you know, history has the answer. Um, and what is the answer to that? I mean, we're a small island. Um, we're the weaker part in this equation. And um, whoever controls the area would control, I mean, whoever controlled the area would control Cyprus in the past. And exactly this is what we, we, we're seeing now. So, I mean, this whole struggle over natural gas, for example, I mean, um, you know, in a historian's eye, this is a struggle for hegemony. It's always been like that. And, you know, uh, using Brzezinski's word, I mean, hegemony is as old as, as, as humankind. So um, no surprises there uh, why this is an area where there's a lot of tension and there is a lot of conflict because uh, geostrategically, it's a very important hub. Um, and unfortunately, we happen to be, um, you know, at the crossroads of, uh, of, of geography and history um, where there's a lot of overlapping um, of tensions. Now, um, I'd like to take the opportunity and I will just use um, um, something very, very important that Dimitris has, has just said, 
And I think it's a very, very, um, it's an important conclusion. And we just said we have a declining of multilateralism, but at the same time, we have the rise of a multipolar world. So it's a, it's a paradox in one sense, it's an oxymoron. Well, at the same time, um, you have a failing of collective action of institutions, of countries working together. At the same time, you have the, the rise of a multipolar world. Now, what does that mean? I mean, it is like the case of the reluctant hegemon basically being the United States. And this, of course, has allowed, um, has allowed the regional players to, to feel that they can grow stronger and they can expand the space, um, you know, taking up the vacuum that um, the, the, the global hegemon has, has left there. Uh, so, and I think this is what we are seeing in the, in the case of, of Turkey. And what is quite worrying for us, um, you know, the view from Cyprus, of course, is the following. Um, it seems that Turkey is not interested in, you know, in playing along in the international system, um, you know, following the rules of the game, as the rules of the game, were, um, you know, had been established um, in, the, in, the, in the past decades. And wh why am I saying that? I am saying that because I think there is no, um, um, there is um, a lack of consideration about um, what the international community thinks or what international law is all about. And this is an argument which I think was made very pertinently by um, my Turkish Cyprus compatriots in the last few days, especially because of Erdogan's visit to Cyprus um, and the way he approached the whole um, question of Famagusta. As we know, in uh, United Nations uh, Security Council Resolution 550, um, and then later on in 789, um, the status of, of Arosha, Famagusta, was established by the Security Council as a city which had to be returned to its lawful um, residents under the, the mandate of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force. Uh, and and, and uh, following the first resolution, the second resolution said, you know, this would be a very good opening to a series of confidence building measures. So, um, uh, Mr. Erdogan, you know, boasting about like a, you know, a, a, a neo-Ottoman sultan, um, you know, holding a picnic or planning to hold a picnic because it was raining cats and dogs yesterday and he couldn't do that. Um, you know, and just parading and showing off the properties, the stolen properties of people, you know, rubbing all in, in old wounds um, was something which actually sent the message to anyone who was interested to hear this. Um, that Turkey is not really interested in, in, you know, in any kind of, you know, in the facade that international law would provide in this case. And this was an argument made not only by Greek Cypriots, not only by the government of the Republic of Cyprus, by the Turkish Cypriots themselves. And there were people there demonstrating Turkish Cypriots saying no uh, picnic over pain, over someone's pain. And I think this is how we all felt um, especially if we, if we bring into the picture that, that, that the place where Mr. Erdogan and his, um, and his entourage passed, we know there's a mass grave of 11 Greek Cypriots, including children in that, in that place. And, you know, this is where he was supposed to have his party. So um, in terms of, uh, of, of symbolism, the message we all got, it, there is no sensitivity. And again, this was an argument used by the Turkish Cypriots who were out there demonstrating yesterday that there was no sensitivity shown by Turkey uh, being the victor in, uh, in, you know, in, in, in 1974, because, you know, that's reality, um, rubbing on, 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 on old wounds and making people feel humiliated uh, and, and very upset by this whole situation. Now, um, of course, uh, when you talk about eliminating um, maritime boundaries, let me just uh, remind everyone uh, for the sake of the argument that the, the Cyprus government has invited Turkey to go to the International Court of Justice in The Hague um, and to discuss this and set the, the boundaries. And of course, Turkey um, did not respond to this. They didn't want to hear about it. We're not interested in this. So um, there was, you know, an, an informal proposition, uh, let's settle this while we're negotiating for other things. And the big question that all the Greek Cypriots, you know, would, would, would ask is, is this, why reinvent the will? If there is international law, if there are agreements um, that can actually settle this question of maritime boundaries, 
uh, in a court of law. Why don't we do that? Why do we have to keep that open um, and, and uh, just, you know, um, having all these kinds of violations that the EU has condemned? Um, the United Nations Security Council has very recently, again, condemned the, the actions of Turkey. And we see that Turkey doesn't care. So the big problem here is that you have a free agent who is moving outside the realm of international law. So if you're the weak party, like Cyprus is the weak party, what can you do? Um, and and um, of course, for us, it's not just a theoretical conundrum of how to come to an agreement. For us, it's a matter of physical survival, because on top of everything else, we've had threats uh, by Ankara, by uh, Mr. Erdogan and his government to remember what they did to us in 1974. And, you know, if we're not good enough, they will do it again uh, <laughs> to us if we don't, you know, succumb to, to what they want. Which I think in terms of, of you know, of, of wanting to be, of Turkey wanting to be a member of the international community, of Turkey wanting to be even, you know, being on the path of European accession, this is totally unacceptable. This is not how Europeans or wannabe Europeans behave in the 21st century. So for us, um, there's this, again, this, this, um, this big problem. Now, if we take it in, in, ter in theoretical terms of conflict resolution, um, you know, going back to Galton, um, the founder of conflict resolution theory, I mean, he talks about negative peace. And what is negative peace is when you drag a part uh, of the negotiation process, a member of the, of the, of the negotiation uh, part, um, process, you drag them to the negotiation table, you threaten them, you blackmail them, you make them sign a peace agreement. So is this what we want in Cyprus? Um, because I'm afraid this is what we're getting and this is what is getting us... Um, very um, skeptical about the intentions of Turkey. And on top of that, we had the threats of partition because when we say a two-state solution, you know, in essence, this is partition because this is not what has been agreed under the United Nations mandate for the whole, you know, all these decades we've been negotiating. There's been uh, compromises being made on the negotiation table. And now Turkey says, oh, I feel very strong now. I can do whatever I like. Nobody is, you know, I don't have any consequences for my behavior, neither by the EU or the United States. So this is a time that I will uh, dictate to the other side that we want partition, we want two states. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, in terms of, 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 uh, of framework, that's a negative peace process. And even if we're dragged to the negotiation table and we are forced to sign something, I don't think this, this peace process, this peace agreement will last. Um, you know, I mean, this is, these are numbers. I mean, 50% of peace agreements anyway fail. So let alone if you had a negative peace process. And to conclude, I mean, there is something else which again worries us very much. Now for a very long time, and maybe it was, it was a wrong um, presumption on, on the part of Cyprus, on the part of Greece, on the part of Brussels. Uh, we thought that because Turkey was on the path of democracy and Turkey was on the path of Europeanization, we would be, um, you know, you, we could have achieved some kind of democratic peace, you know, two democratic states don't go to war. So let's encourage Turkey, let's accept Turkey uh, into the European Union, let's encourage the process, um, you know, um, democracy will, will, will um, increase rather than decrease in, in terms of all the democratic indicators in Turkey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, again, this process has been reversed. Because I don't think anybody can really argue in any convincing way that Turkey is, is on the path of democratic development as we speak. Um, and I will not go into detail about that because I think it's quite obvious what is going on now and how Mr. Erdogan and, his, um, and the elites around him have entrenched themselves in power uh, and are planning to be there for a long time um, and, and not willing to go anywhere. And at the same time, um, freedom of speech and um, the rule of law uh, are going downhill in Turkey. So again, um, asking us um, to, to be embroiled in any kind of situation uh, where the other partner is not a democratic state is again, um, very perplexing. And um, actually, um, let's say it, it, it's, it's an important threat, uh, not on a theoretical level, but actually on, on a very physical um, right to survive on this island where we've been for thousands of years. 
So that's my two cents of wisdom to start to kick off the, the discussion. And I'm very much interested to see what, what the others uh, have to say about this. Thank you very much, Anna. I think it was a lot of fire against uh, Turkey, at least against Erdogan. Um, and uh, Mustafa Aydin, uh, he's not the spokesman of Mr. Erdogan, but uh, I think he has some arguments which uh, are not uh, supporting uh, what you said. But anyway, it's up to him to come in with his uh, contribution. Mustafa, please. Thank you, Anas. Uh, well, I have been so many of this kind of meetings, of either webinar or face-to-face, -face, so I'm too experienced to get into the discussion who said what and what meant what, because I can easily and immediately on top of from my head, I can find maybe two pages of quotations uh, which shows or at least seems to show the weaknesses and the problems of the Greek Cypriots or the Greeks, but that's not going to help to understand the situation. Uh, so let me start by thanking Dimitri, who took the role of uh, explaining a wider context for this issue. Uh, and that saves us time. Um, and Hannes, you ask us to look into the history also in order to a little bit understand what's happening today. So I'll, I'll, I choose today to deal with how Turkey over the years, not recently, but over the years, have seen Eastern Mediterranean and Mediterranean in general. Um, of course, deep into the psyche and deep into the history, uh, there is a memory of Ottoman Empire having at one time ruling over the Mediterranean. I'm not saying this just now because people are longing for it, but just to make uh, people to understand there is this memory there, just as the memories of other countries might have uh, from that time. Secondly, during the 20th century, and most of it actually, uh, Turkey did not really have a policy of the Mediterranean. Uh, it, not, it did not really classify itself as a Mediterranean country. Uh, of course, uh, Hannes reminded us when he sent us messages that actually Mediterranean was quite important just before and during the Second World War. And that, of course, reminded me that Mediterranean was conceived as a place where a threat would come to Turkey just before and during the Second World War. Uh, it was the perceived Italian threat that pushed Turkey uh, towards um, the alliance with, uh, uh, with England and France rather than the German uh, perceived German threat. And it was, again, perceived Italian threat in the Mediterranean uh, from uh, actually late um, 1920s where unidentified submarines started sinking uh, shipping in the Eastern Mediterranean and very close to Turkish uh, shores that kept Turkey out of the war at least in the first year of the Second World War. It was such an important that Turkey's uh, in the treaty that trilateral treaty that Turkey, France, and, uh, and England signed in 1939, one of the conditions of possible Turkish entrance into the war was that if the war expand into the Mediterranean. So all other cases were disqualified unless the war expanded into the Mediterranean, Turkey would not be, never be uh, part of the uh, Second World War. Anyway, eventually Turkey found other clauses not to enter the war, uh, but that was the first instinct. During most of the uh, 20th century, during the Cold War, in fact, Turkey and I think Greece also tried very hard to keep the Aegean Sea separate from the Mediterranean Sea. Two countries actually have uh, uh, not fight it, but have uh, conflicting with each other uh, most of the 20th century, most of the Cold War, uh, but they tried to prevent these conflicts to spill over uh, into the Eastern Mediterranean. And I remember um, various texts uh, or speeches from the Turkish Foreign Ministry saying that, you know, this Mediterranean is different from the uh, Aegean Sea. We have 
several problems there with Greece. Agency is a special case. Mediterranean is different. And for Turkey, and I would argue that for most of the NATO countries, during the Cold War, Eastern Mediterranean meant Cyprus. Uh, I have several books just my, uh, you know, uh, in my back here about Cyprus. Uh, you can see here already Cyprus uh, in Turkish, but there are others. But I have a couple of books looking into the Eastern Mediterranean security situation during the Cold War written by non-Turks and non-Greeks. And they were talking about Cyprus, importance of Cyprus for the security of NATO. So Cy for the NATO countries and including Turkey, I think uh, during most of the Cold War, when we talk about Mediterranean, we really talk about uh, Cyprus issue and nothing else. Um, after the end of the Cold War, Mediterranean has in started to increasingly become an important issue for Turkey, and especially uh, since the early 2000s. And there are three, I think, three issues or three dimensions of this that brought Mediterranean more into the Turkish discussion. And interestingly, some sort of a Mediterranean identity, at, at least in foreign policy, is being uh, forged now. Uh, now there are articles, you can see various articles or even books being written about Turkey's Mediterranean policy, whereas you would not find any such article uh, written before uh, 1990s. Uh, one of the first issue of why Mediterranean has become important uh, for Turkey, has become a, 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 has risen in the agenda is the, I think it's increasing geopolitical importance of the Eastern Mediterranean, especially since the Arab uprising, but even before that, but since Arab uprisings, there is a very clear, uh, very understandable and seeable uh, rise in the uh, importance of geopolitical importance of Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, many countries started to pay attention. Those countries who were not really interested and who did, who did not show much interest in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, during the Cold War, they became much more interested in the Eastern Mediterranean and Cyprus as a whole. And Cyprus, in this sense, has been seen, it seems to be seen, as a gateway to a larger geography uh, around the Eastern Mediterranean. It's not only Cyprus, it's not only Turkey. Now, uh, if you put Cyprus into the middle of the compass, and you would uh, have an access to, to various regions. And we have seen this here, a uh, number of countries bringing their militaries into the region. During the Cold War, the, the balance between United States and Soviet Union and balance between Greece and Turkey uh, kept the region in check. But this kind of balances, as Dimitri has already highlighted, has been missing in the region in recent years also, which contributed to this changing geopolitical uh, situation in the region. Uh, now, several countries, um, not only regional countries, but United States, Russia now, for the first time in the history, France, and obviously UK because of its basis, Israel much more now than in history, Egypt, uh, Turkey and Greece, they all, and of course the Cyprus, uh, have military forces in this region, very in a close proximity to each other, which elevates the importance of region for Turkey. The second issue, why it becomes so important now, is of course potential of energy, and nobody should deny that and can deny that. Uh, and energy means uh, its importance for economic and wider political reasons uh, for Turkey. And one has to remind, remember what happened in late 1970s uh, in the Northern Aegean Sea. Uh, Dimitri would know this, of course, we have talked this number of times. In the late 1970s, after the Cyprus uh, operation of Turkey, uh, Greece and Turkey uh, locked in uh, counter arguments and tensions in the northern Aegean because of the possibility possibility of the energy resources at the time it was oil under the sea. And it continued despite the arguments and discussion that various people argued that there was not enough 
energy resources to fight over in the Norwegian Aegean Sea. But it went on until it was really proven there was no energy resources worth fighting in the Northern Aegean. So two countries already have this experience and they only ended this crisis with a moratorium in the Aegean Sea because they found out that it was not enough energy resources in the region. So this is, and the same is, could be said in the Eastern Mediterranean and for the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, it is not a new problem. People are talking as if this problem emerged a year ago when Turkey started to challenging the developments in the region. In fact, Turkey has been challenging the developments in the region since the late 1990s. Uh, I found out a document when I was looking all this that I was one of the first organizers in Turkey bringing to academia, decision makers and think tankers together in 1997 to discuss how to respond to the changing energy environment in the Eastern Mediterranean and how to respond to the Cypriot government, Greek Cypriot government in Turkey, of course, uh, to its moves in the region. So already in late 1990s, this was an issue in Turkey and Turkish foreign ministry, ministry had judicially, uh, every time there was a move from the uh, Greek Cypriot government, they also uh, declared protestation. They sent protestation to the United Nations, to the European Union when it mattered, and to the international community when the European Union didn't matter. So there was always uh, protestations, but it was political and it was diplomatic protests. And nobody really listened to that until, well, a couple of years back, Turkey started to sending ships, Navy, to the area. And until a year ago, when Turkey decided to take it even further with, uh, with its ships and not only Navy ships, but also drilling ships. Uh, so it's not a new problem in the region from the energy aspect. Finally, the third issue why it, it became so elevated in Turkey is the strategic importance of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, to Turkey. This is different than geopolitical changes and balances in the region. Turkey looks Eastern Mediterranean in connection with the Aegean Sea. Uh, not everybody... Um, admit not everybody connects this linkage, obviously, but when you dig enough, there is a connection in Turkish, especially military mind, a con between Aegean Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. They are both strategically, it, it is strategically unacceptable or it's deemed strategically unacceptable in Turkey to have same country controlling both the Aegean Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean especially if this one country is considered as not friendly enough to Turkey. So the, the bigger problem or double problem for Turkey is that Greek Cypriot government in, the, uh, in Cyprus and also uh, Greece are cooperating to control the region in a Turkish mind to linking the region uh, of Asia um, to the Mediterranean. This creates a kind of a uh, blockage from the Turkish perspective where Turkey could not really go into the international waters uh, unimpeded. Of course, in peacetime, everybody would do everything, but you have to think the worst case scenarios when you are thinking international relations and for the future of the countries. So from the Turkish perspective, the worst case scenario is a possibility of conflict and war uh, with Greece, and in that case, would not Turkey would not like to see control of Eastern Mediterranean by Greece or by the Greek allies of Greece. Uh, so this is a this has been a strategic perception of especially from the military in Turkey, uh, and the recent creation of Eastern Mediterranean Forum or Energy Forum, uh, Turkey sees its creation as a hostile ganging up against Turkey in the region and an attempt to block Turkey's unimpeded access to international waters. Again, these are not, obviously not all of them are my views, but I'm trying to convey what the Turkish government and also in general Turkish people are thinking. Dimitris knows and Ahmed also knows this very well that I conduct public po 
public uh, perception surveys in Turkey. And one of the, I think, biggest mistakes is being done, especially in the West, is that everything they assume everything is being done on the whims of the president in Turkey and or small group of decision makers in Turkey. But when you do public surveys in Turkey, you would see that there is a wide majority, uh, widespread majority on this kind of issues. And it's the Mediterranean is uh, one of them. Turkish establishment of uh, it's the Mediterranean uh, uh, forum without even inviting Turkey uh, is a very, very clear act of hostile move that needs to be opposed, blocked, and if possible, replaced. So this brings me to the question of Hannes actually put to us whether an alternative possibility uh, is possible in the region. I think it would be possible in the region if other actors would get involved and if Turkey would be allowed to in involve from the first instance onwards instead of uh, being presented a fait accompli in the region. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. So many arguments have been brought forward by different sides. So, Ahmed, what is left? What is your contribution? Yeah. Where you can fill what some is left to say? Right, exactly. Well, let me first start by thanking the Center for International and European Studies, as well as the International Institute for Peace for this kind invitation. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to say that we had this crisis coming, approaching to us in a very slow motion. We actually saw that uh, since uh, the uh, mid 2000s uh, with the uh, start of the um, bilateral um, agreements on the uh, EZ delineation. But especially after 2010, things started to speed up. We have seen this uh, crisis approaching and uh, a lot of us have been actually uh, telling this uh, publicly. But um, let me start to explain this, starting from a global perspective, then zooming into the regional as well as to, uh, uh, to actually where we are. I think this coincided with uh, the changes uh, global changes uh, in the power configuration, uh, the uh, relative decline of the United States, the relative uh, rise of China, and maybe less relative, but rise of Russia, uh, which created this new situation where everybody tried to situate themselves, meaning all states tried to situate themselves in a better position in this new power configuration or new power balance. So things like uh, the Brexit, where the uh, UK uh, left United uh, uh, European Union uh, uh, is also part of this equation uh, where we have started seeing France becoming more aggressive, more visible, uh, trying to sort of uh, fill the void that uh, uh, Brexit created. Um, this also coincided with the rise of uh, populist politi politi uh, uh, politics in the world. Uh, and Trump also enhanced this uh, relative uh, power, uh, new power configuration in the world. Um, when we zoom in to more close to the region, the Arab Spring uh, and the tectonic developments in the Middle East have increased this. Um, and I think um, in 2013, uh, with the Gezi movements in Turkey, um, you know, I, I started thinking that, you know, there are important forks in the individuals or states' lives. You know, which way you took uh, changes uh, the, the, the type of positions that you are going to take in the future. Uh, the Gezi movement was unfortunately perceived by the then Erdogan government as a big threat. 
So instead of, uh, uh, let's say, mellowing this down, um, uh, Turkey chose another path uh, domestically, becoming more and more, um, let's say, authoritarian. This increased the, uh, 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 this was increased with the coup attempt in Turkey. So the, uh, um, uh, domestically, Turkey take a, um, let's say, a U-turn from where it was. And of course, uh, uh, in foreign policy wise, we started seeing uh, um, Turkey changing its foreign policy course vis-a-vis uh, -vis Syria uh, and vis-a-vis -vis the, um, in the region. Um, so this is how we came to uh, this situation. And I think that the Greek Cypriot dominated Republic of Cyprus, as well as Greece, um, took another fork and sort of managed to form a block in front of Turkey with the cooperation with Israel, with cooperation with Egypt and the other regional countries. Of course, Turkey's foreign policy turn also helped uh, when Turkey uh, sort of uh, um, um, started having sour relations with Israel and, and Egypt, uh, usually following more ideological rather than more pragmatic uh, 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 steps also helped this process where Turkey was sort of isolated in this region. And the last couple of years, I think Turkey started feeling this isolation, feeling this sort of um, left out. And that's why it started taking both diplomatic as well as a more military show of force, more gumbo diplomacy in order to sort of um, prevent or to block this uh, sort of feta accompli by, by this newly emerging bloc in front of Turkey. So the diplomatic step in Libya or the gunboat diplomacy by say, sending the Navy uh, to the region to block uh, ENI, for example, from drilling, and finally buying uh, 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 its own drilling ships and sending them to the region is part of this equation. In a way, the Turkish, uh, when we come to more towards Cyprus, you know, zooming in from all this uh, uh, re uh, uh, global regional to more uh, micro level um, uh, on the Cyprus level, I think that what Turkey is doing today with the kind of position it took, like uh, partially opening part of the fenced area of Varosha, and um, supporting more openly some of the uh, uh, two-state solution supporters in Cyprus is a kind of reaction, is a kind of retaliation to the Greek Cypriot stance on two areas. One, on the Cyprus negotiations, because in the uh, perception of Turkey, it was the Greek Cypriots who refused the UN peace plan in 2004. And then more importantly, in 2017, when three guarantor powers um, locked their foreign ministers into a small town in Cran Montana, Switzerland, for 10 days, it was the Greek Cypriot president who walked out from the negotiations and, and led to the collapse of the negotiations. So it was this frustration to that, as well as to the Greek Cypriot stance, the Republic of Cyprus government stance on not uh, willing to negotiate with Turkey Cypriots anything related to the natural resources of, of the island. So this explains from the global to, to, to the more uh, micro level. Now, uh, what needs to be done in my uh, opinion is that I, I still believe that Cyprus holds the key. So solving the Cyprus problem can actually play a, an important key role in triggering the solution of other problems in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the wider Mediterranean. So what is uh, more practically needs to be done is we need a Cran Montana style international conference that would bring the two Cypriot sides as well as the three guarantor powers together again 
Last time in Cran Montana, we had two negotiation tables. Table one was on the um, internal aspects of the Cyprus problem. And table two was on the future security architecture of uh, Cyprus, United Cyprus, which included the three guarantor powers. I think that those two tables are necessary, but I think that there should be a third negotiation table, maybe on an informal level, that would bring the two sides in Cyprus, as well as the three guarantor powers, especially Greece and Turkey, to the table to, to talk about the future delineation of maritime borders between United Cyprus and Turkey, and hopefully some sort of common understanding uh, uh, between Turkey and Greece for a potential delineation in the, in the Aegean. I think that if maybe that's a very tall order, I'm, I'm very aware of that, but I think that if we manage to do that, this can in fact trigger the solution of other outstanding uh, problems in the Eastern Mediterranean. So the way to go is to engage people, to engage the countries, not to isolate. Now, if Turkey needs to be uh, shown the stick, and that's usually the case in every negotiation, you use the carrot as well as the stick, you don't do it in public, especially to the Erdogan's government. Because if it is done publicly, uh, he will retaliate uh, five, with five times more magnitude. So everything needs to be done behind closed doors, both stick as well as genuine carrot so that Turkey can, um, can do the uh, compromises as well as also gain something that can sell to the Turkish people as some sort of uh, both political as well as economic uh, 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 gain. So I'll stop here and if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you, thank you very much for all of you. And I want to remind our uh, visitors and listeners and viewers that they can put questions, that can fall, put forward them to you. I will take up two issues, uh, just mention those over Ahmed and ask you to come in, all of you. The first is, of course, on the Cyprus issue. I mean, I must confess I'm, not, I'm biased uh, because I have for many, many years when in the European Parliament, talked to my friends in the Greek Cypriot side and also the Turkish Cypriot side about how Germany, for example, overcome so many conflicts and, and went the, the way of, of unification. I must openly say I have not the feeling that the Greek Cypriot side was interested in having a compromise, which is a real compromise. It would have been difficult, the Annan plan, to realize and implement, I must confess. And when I spoke to the presidents of Cyprus, I could agree with some of their arguments. But the fact is, the Greek Cypriot side rejected it and the Turkish Cypriot side accepted it. And the second issue is, of course, on the energy. How can you say the energy we get out of the sea, the gas, is benefiting the Greek side, but not the Turkish part of Cyprus? I think that must lead to a reaction. That's, that's logic. So this is my question. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, this is my logic. And, I, I, and if you say again and again, yes, in principle, we want to go join, you know, to have a unified Cyprus, but the fact that we block it, at the end, it leads to a two-state solution, if you want or not. Not now, not in five years, but finally it will, unless you have the courage and the energy to do what Ahmed just said. This is my personal opinion, maybe I'm wrong, and please react. Uh, I, I would, uh, of course, uh, confess when I'm totally wrong. And the second issue is what I don't understand on Turkey's side. If Turkey, and I agree with what Mustafa said, and also it was mentioned by Ahmed, when Turkey really has an interest to be have a strong role, why doesn't it overcome its issues with Israel and with Egypt? Of course, I even agree with some points and some criticism of, of Erdogan on the Israeli government, Netanyahu's governments, uh, dealing with the Palestinian issue. But he has no influence. He has less influence on, Erdogan, on, on Netanyahu and the Israeli government now. And of course, you can have, I'm friend of the, 
you know, of, of the former president in, in Egypt, and Sisi is um, at least authoritarian. But authoritarian people can understand each other, you know, so it's not so an so, uh, uh, opposite uh, situation. So I don't understand why Aragon is not a bit pragmatic and trying to have an alliance with these countries if he wants really to have an influence in the area. Because the alternative is, as we saw, that Cyprus, Israel, Egypt go together. And we know that the United States is at least strongly on Israel's side. Russia is partly on Israel's side, but not always on Turkey's side, as we saw recently. So maybe these two questions, but you can, uh, of course, take up everything else. So um, maybe, Anna, you, we ask you first to, to react and to come in, and then uh, Dimitrios, and then, you know, everybody's is up to, and again, if people uh, see some questions already coming, I will come in with these questions afterwards. Please, Anna. Yes, um, let me just address first the question, um, the, the paradigm you use, the German paradigm, because I think it's, it's, it's the wrong historical paradigm. Now, in what sense? Now, in, in Germany, you had a divided country, which was kept divided by, um, by the great power struggles. And when exactly did Germany get uh, united? It got united when, Soviet, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. So basically, the, the, um, the aggressor, let's say, on, on one side, or let's say that the big power pole on one side just didn't exist anymore. And secondly, which again is very important, you had the same people. You had people speaking German, um, having a common history, having a common political uh, path, um, since um, the unification of Germany in 1870. So it wasn't really that difficult to get those people to live together. So um, let me just recap then what's going on in Cyprus. Now in Cyprus, um, as the United Nations Security Council resolutions recognize, uh, the northern part of it is occupied. Now, if it's occupied, as the resolutions say, and you have a cessationist state, which is the product of occupation, occupation means an occupying army. Now, if the occupying army doesn't go away, then there is no feelings of security for the Greek Cypriots. And that is exactly why the negotiations in Crown Montana fell through, because there was actually no agreement on the withdrawal of Turkish, um, the Turkish wish for guarantees. So the big pole, power pole, um, keeping the division in place hasn't gone out of the picture as it happened in the case of Germany. And let me, to build on this very, very briefly, I've heard in many cases um, talks of the Franco-German cooperation and how the European Union started through the coal and steel and so on and so forth. Again, my, 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 my point would be the following. Germany, who was the aggressor, was disarmed, was harmless, had no option. They had to cooperate with the French. And of course, they had the American shepherd and the money of the Marshall Plan to fuel this whole situation to keep going and to create an engranage process. So if we're going back to history, the analogies of Germany and the analogies of the Franco-German cooperation cannot apply in the, in the, in the case of Germany, any of Cyprus, because you have a totally different historical setting in place. And that's why we insist that we cannot survive on the island unified if we have Turkish guarantees in the 21st century and if we have Turkish army being present, both in the case of the Franco-German um, uh, cooperation and in the unification of Germany, the, the armies were gone. So um, now on the case of natural gas, let me just remind you that there was a convergence during the negotiations um, of uh, the natural gas resources being handled by the federal government, the Talat uh, Christofias convergence, Plus, very recently, President Anastasiadis exactly to uh, settle this issue of, of uncertainty on behalf of the, of the Turkish Cypriots. He did propose to Mustafa Akinti that an escrow account is created. And when there we have, you know, profits from natural gas, if this is ever, you know, ever materializes, they will go into an escrow account in accordance with the convergence. So there will be no concern of anyone exploiting the other side. Um, I, you know, um, so this question could have been settled, but again, um, the Turkish Cypriots said they were not interested in this proposition. So, I mean, it's quite easy to say, oh, the Greek Cypriots did not accept the Annan plan in 2004, uh, or the Greek Cypriots did not um, um, uh, accept what was going on in, in Crown Montana, but I think it's quite um, 
Uh, it, it doesn't help the situation if there is no effort to understand the reasons behind the insecurities that the presence of the Turkish army generates among the Greek Cypriots. Um, and if we, keep, we are being reminded all the time of what happened to us in 1974, and we haven't forgotten what happened to us in 1994, um, the presence of the Turkish army in Cyprus cannot in any way allow, um, a, you know, um, a, a, a reunification of the island to take place. Thank you. We'll come with another question uh, from the colleagues, but maybe Dimitrios and Mustafa. Dimitrios? Yeah, um, well, I mean, all I can say is listening to this debate, taking part in it, and always think about Greek-Turkish relations and what happens in Cyprus. And then I think about what's happening in other parts of the world, like Nagorno-Karabakh, and I say, my goodness, how lucky we are. And I think the fact that, uh, you know, we have learned to live without going to a lot conflict tells us a lot about what we can do, what we can do. And I think potentially, I mean, Ahmed laid out uh, a plan for Cyprus, but I think in general, potentially, the, the solutions are all there. They can be resolved. I mean, I'm even thinking about, you know, the whole issue about the East Met Gas Forum. And, and I, I, was, as I, was, I, I, I was listening to you. I found the Greek prime minister statements uh, on October 21st, which was the last trilateral meeting between uh, Mitsotakis, Al-Sisi, and Anastasiadis in Cyprus. And, and at some stage in his remarks, he goes, you know, we must not forget, he says, the statute of the East Med Gas Forum signed, was signed a month ago, which includes Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Egypt, uh, Italy, Jordan, and Palestine, cooperating on energy issues. I will say it again. Turkey can participate in this partnership too. It can also participate in our trilateral partnerships. It has never been excluded in principle by anyone, yet its actions bring about its margin, marginalization. And again, we, we tend to look at the negatives, because out of those remarks, what was highlighted, for example, in the Greek press, in the Turkish press as well, was Mitsotakis warning Turkey not to overdo it, while in the SAID statement, you also have the potential of something out there. And I think this is the things we're not looking at. Just like, how do you, you know, uh, Ahmed said very, I think correctly in a way, but maybe, you know, how he says the key lies in resolving the Cyprus issue, uh, or maybe it's a simultaneous approach. Because it's about building trust. It's about building trust. And, and we have a modicum of trust because we are not worried. We should be, maybe, but we are not. We, we've shown resilience into, you know, either Cyprus or Greece and Turkey becoming an, another Nagorno-Karabakh, where the track is totally lacking. And, and, and I, I think uh, we need to have this realization that um, the windows of opportunities are closing, be it in Cyprus even though Cyprus is interesting because, you know, there's a counter argument. If, you know, right now, there's a lot of talk about a two-state solution. But an argument is that, well, maybe it's not a valid two-state solution. It's just there as a negotiating ploy because it would mean that if this were to occur, Turkey, Turkey loses basically all its leverage within the EU as well. I mean, which would have had more leverage with finding a solution for a united Cyprus, whether it's a federation, a confederation, or whatever, right? Some say. So, so we'll see. But I mean, what we are seeing is, is that the parameters of our solutions are there. So whether it is Cyprus first and putting an effort there, and now conceivably one can that since uh, in the north uh, there's a new president, that you had elections, uh, or it's some sort, something which is, you know, the positive package between the EU and Turkey, the positive agenda, starting exploratory talk between Greece and Turkey that can move to an agenda or at least an agreement that on certain issues we need to negotiate at The Hague, which means takes, take the politics out of it, the, the, the political pressure out of the leaders and allow for some sort of uh, compromise that the courts will find. And simultaneously, this can resolve uh, issues on a number of fronts because it's not just Cyprus or, or what Greece and Turkey could take to The Hague. It's also the issue of the extension of territorial waters, which, as I said, it's Greece's sovereign right in the Aegean. But under what conditions will it do it so that it does not raise tensions? Uh, it's also a question of how we educate our publics. Uh, the fact that the Greek prime minister, and I keep saying this, says all the time now, it's been a Greek position, but this, he says every time that, oh, we go to The Hague, is in itself a willingness to compromise. It's in itself a willingness to compromise. Or that 
there are a number of analysts such as myself, and when, when we get on Greek media or we write, we say that Greece has the right to extend its territorial waters up to 12 nautical miles. Just by saying up to, we are trying to educate the public. It's not 12 nautical miles, which is what everybody thinks. It's up to 12, and there are ways around it. And I think, so we, we, we can have the parameters of doing this, uh, but somehow uh, we are caught in our own discourses or, uh, you know, the tit-for-tat game. Well, if your ships withdraw first, uh, then I withdraw my ships. Then we sit down to negotiate. And, 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 and there is what Ahmed, and I totally agree with Ahmed, uh, how a lot of this has become so public, you know, this public diplomacy, this public arena, this damn Twitter, which is destroying. I mean, it's, it's incredible. We talk about Trump, but every government is doing this right now, not in a Trumpian way. But I mean, the spokespersons, the ministers and everybody are just using this medium out there just to send out their message, which most of the time I don't think is constructive. Uh, while, you know, we are, they were smart enough people. I think our leaders are smart enough. Uh, all their advisors and all of us are smart enough, we know the issues, to find the roots of the solution. And of course, not to focus so much on, on history because we keep focusing. We need to know our history. No one says should, we should forget our history. We should all know where we come from. But we need to look to the present and the future. And that's, that's what we're not doing. And, 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 and so I am not saying this from a position of an idealist. Mustafa will accuse me. I'm always too optimistic. Fine. But because I would like to think that there's a future out there. And I see that we have the parameters around. And, 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 and this is what we, you know, we, and it's interesting to last point. In all our assessment, we all talk about the systemic change. This is already a basis. Let's take that, how we see the systemic change and it's affecting from multilateralism to multipolarity. All of us spoke about this. Listen to each other and then build from there. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. We need some optimistic people at least. Mustafa, and then I yes. will put the question to you from the audience and start with Ahmed. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'll keep it short because the, I see several questions are coming from yes. the audience, so I'll keep very short. And thank you, Dimitri. Uh, of course, I always appreciate his optimism. Uh, it allows me to, to, to be pessimist. Otherwise, <laughs> it will be only one-sided. So we balance each other here. Uh, but... Uh, I agree almost everything is being said. Uh, I also do believe that priority here is to talk and get people to engage in, in dialogue. Uh, and there are various ways of doing that, of course, uh, with, with or without involvement of international community. Uh, when I was listening, Ahmed, I was writing down, uh, if I remember correctly, Turkey, Turkish position uh, Turkey has suggested three different meetings uh, in recent months. One is about Cyprus. Uh, this is this five-way uh, meeting for Cyprus to explore where we are in Cyprus. Uh, mm -hmm. And that comes from, um, I, Dimitri and I went to Ankara and talked to different people and decision makers for a project. And part, when we are doing that, I also keep asking uh, different questions and trying to see how foreign policy is currently being made in Turkey and what are the uh, priorities. And when we, talk, when we talked about uh, the Cyprus issue, why Turkey seems to changing at the time its po position, now we know that Turkey has changed its position as of yesterday, but about a month ago it was still was changing. Uh, and one of the explanation that keep coming uh, from different people was, and at least that how I understand, there was a very deep and deepening distrust and frustration uh, with the Greek Cypriot position uh, over the years. As Ahmed mentioned, um, Anand Pilan and Kram Montana, these two have left quite a, it seems have left quite an impression, especially because the same people in Turkey involved in both cases. And same people who involved in both cases who promoted for solution uh, against those hardliners in the country get burned at, at the end. Because they always, at the end of the uh, both uh, Annan Plan and the Kran Montana, they, the, the liberal people who wanted to solve these issues always get told that, yeah, we told you so. They would never would agree. Why are you compromising? 
I think something very similar is happening and happened in Greece. Uh, please don't underestimate the election of new president Tatar in nor northern Cyprus. Uh, and it's, I know that there are arguments and it's part of it is true. Turkey tried heavily to influence the result of the elections in northern Cyprus, but this is not the first time. Remember, last two presidents were very pro-solution, very liberal pro-solution uh, in Cyprus. Uh, but it seems that the people in, in, uh, in the Turkish Cypriot uh, part of the um, island have now totally frustrated, and they went this time uh, for more a hardliner who is now defining or, or who is now arguing for two-state solution instead of uh, bizonal, bicommunal federation. So maybe a way, one of the ways, let's start talking if, this, if it's five-way meeting for Cyprus. Okay, let's try that first and then try to move two-way negotiations again. The second meeting I think was offered from Turkey and I, I, don't, I don't see any takers of that idea, but nevertheless it's on the table, is a multilateral meeting for Eastern Mediterranean to, to explore the energy issues. Uh, I think the European Union uh, High Commissioner briefly uh, took up this idea also. Maybe there is a life there for this idea. Uh, if, if, if so, it will be good. And the third one is uh, uh, an idea talking Eastern Mediterranean or including Eastern Mediterranean into the Turkish-Greek exploratory talks. Of course, the problem with the exploratory talks have that they have not started yet, <laughs> even though the prime ministers and the uh, uh, president and the foreign ministers have agreed to start them. They have not yet started, but eventually they will. And that's, uh, uh, I agree with here, the, the good thing about the, this proximity or exploratory talks between Greece and Turkey was and has been that they were secret, not public talks. Okay, we, it's very easy to criticize, and I have done a number of times, meeting 60 plus times and not solving the issues, it's easily criticized. And I have done that a number of times. But the fact that two sides are talking has, has always been important. I think it's more important today than, uh, than anything. So I think the priority should be today is to, to bring back Greece and Turkey for this non-public talks and discussions, which might lead to talks in the Eastern Mediterranean and new talks in Cyprus. Finally, the question that actually uh, posed by Hannes, and I totally agree with him, why Turkey does not overcome its problems with Israel and Egypt. Uh, I keep asking that publicly in Turkey, and I keep arguing importance of that in Turkey, so I don't need to do it here. And the reason why it's not happening, I have no answer. I'm sorry. Um, you know. I follow very much in Turkish politics, but when it comes to this, it comes to a level that there is no, un we cannot go beyond and understand the response to this question. And I keep, I will keep asking this question also in Turkey. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I think we should come to a, to a final round and I would ask you perhaps to take up some of the questions uh, in this final round. There was, first of all, a question about uh, Joe Biden, and there's also a question about Russia. What would it change? Maybe, Ahmed, you can also deal with that. Yeah. Then uh, also the question of Turkey in the South Caucasus. Uh, Mustafa, Ahmed, you can, or Dimitris. Um, and then specifically to Anna, maybe, uh, there was the question about the Belarus uh, uh, san the sanction issue when... Uh, uh, Cyprus vetoed uh, the federal sanctions and combined that with the Turkish sanctions. And maybe an interesting question, uh, would political equality uh, instead of uh, military presence be a way out? You know, to say Turkish and Cyp Greek Cypriot side have the same rights and the same position, then uh, the, the military would leave. Uh, which is would be very difficult, but anyway, this was the question. Maybe you can come into this uh, a bit to to give our uh, listeners and viewers also uh, the feeling that the uh, questions have been taken up. But may uh, be Ahmed, you can start also yeah. take up some of this question and react. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Just to start with, uh, um, I agree with your evaluation, Hannes, regarding Cyprus. 
Uh, I think the two important issues in Cyprus, uh, the key issues, one is the political equality and sharing power. And the other one is what Anna sort of implied, which is the security issue. Um, the U UN Secretary General Kofi Annan very openly said after the uh, uh, referendum in 2004 that the real problem is whether you know the two sides, especially the Greek Cypriot side, is ready to share the power uh, with Turkish Cypriots, or whether um, the Turkish Cypriots were seen as a kind of partner or as a minority. Because as you know, the Cyprus problem didn't start in 74. I mean, the UN peacekeeping force has been in Cyprus since 1964. And the Turkish Cypriot uh, partner of the Republic has been absent from that supposedly bi-communal uh, partnership Republic. In any case, so I think that um, uh, power sharing is very important. I still do believe that there is a chance, maybe a last chance, maybe a final chance to, to try this, because if we can try this and we are successful in solving the Cyprus problem, as I said, it can trigger other problems, um, uh, solving the other problems. Now, something that Mustafa mentioned, if you look at the last 20 years of the uh, elections in Cyprus, uh, the uh, uh, presidential elections in the Northern Cyprus, Start with 2000, it was Mr. Denktaş, 2005 Talat, 2010 Mr. Erolu, 2015 Mr. Akinci, and 2020 Tata. Right, left, right, left, right. So to me, that's the pendulum swinging from one side to the other. I remember when Mr. Erolu was uh, 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 elected after Talat, I said that this was a message by the Greeks, uh, by the Turkish Cypriots to both Greek Cypriots as well as the international community, including EU and uh, the UN. And it is this, look guys, we give you five years, this pro-solution guy, you work with him, you don't like him, try this one. And then come back five years later, we'll give you another pro-solution. If you are not ready, then, I think that there is some, this kind of uh, pendulum swimming from one to the other side. But anyway, but food for thought. Now, Biden. As I said before we start this discussion today, um, starting the last couple of weeks, I say that uh, I started having at least a glimmer of hope uh, in this uh, uh, interesting times that the whole world is uh, passing through. One is the uh, election of Biden after Trump, and the other one is uh, uh, maybe the um, uh, uh, possibility of uh, a good resulted vaccines. Now, joke aside, I think that Biden will need to repair some of the damage, both domestically as well as internationally, that Trump administration has done on institutions, uh, both domestically, as I said, and internationally. Biden will turn his face to the other side of the transatlantic and will try to patch up the relations with the European allies. So maybe it is too early, but I, I believe that Biden administration will be more visible together with the European allies in this region, both in Eastern Mediterranean, as well as in, in the Middle East. Remember during EMEA Karda crisis, we had uh, United States sort of uh, uh, doing the fire uh, fight. It was Richard Holbrook who came to prevent uh, the two countries from the brink of a war. What happened a couple of months ago when Turkey and Greece uh, had a tension in the Eastern Mediterranean, where was United States? So I don't think that that would be the case under Biden's administration. And Biden is interestingly somebody uh, who actually visited Cyprus when he was the uh, vice president uh, after Lyndon Johnson so many years later. So he's not a stranger to the Cyprus problem. He actually met with the two leaders and he actually proposed some confidence building measures. So during his administration, I think the state, uh, uh, the secretary of state, whoever he is going to appoint, will be more visible and will be more engaged with the uh, parties uh, in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Please. Uh, 
Um, just to uh, pick up on, on what Ahmed just mentioned on the involvement of the Americans, I mean, um, Jeffrey Pyatt, for example, the uh, American ambassador in Athens, um, was bragging, and I was there when he did it at the Economist Conference in Greece like two months ago, that his boss, uh, Mike Pompeo, had scored a diplomatic victory when the Oroz race went back in, um, you know, in, 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 in its Turkish harbor, and, 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 you know, tensions calmed down. At the same time, um, the, the German press was saying exactly the same, that it was a diplomatic victory for Angela Merkel. And then a few days later, the Oruz race was back out again. Um, so I'm not so sure if it's the absence of diplomacy which is causing this um, mayhem in the area. I think it's the absence of, um, of incentives uh, on the part of Turkey to comply, let's say, with what its allies are asking it to do or um, are suggesting. So, um, and just, to, you know, because we've talked about public diplomacy and, 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 and secret diplomacy, um, I mean, I'm quite puzzled why we've been saying that there hasn't been any secret diplomacy because only like a couple of months ago, Mr. Tsavusoglu came out and said, oh, we've been having secret talks with the Greek government in Berlin. And, and you know, it caused, I mean, it, it wreaked havoc in, in, in Greece. Mitsotakis was, was quite in a lot of trouble. So, you know, talking about demolishing trust between two sides, um, why when you're talking, you know, secretly, and this is what governments do. I mean, we all know that. And this is, you know, how serious diplomacy is conducted. It's behind closed doors. And I do agree with everybody who was mentioned before, you know, this public confrontation doesn't really help anyone. So um, I think we really need to call a spade a spade when we're analyzing things so we can be more realistic as to what to expect. And now, you know, trying to close now on a positive note, uh, because I, I don't want Dimitris to be the only optimist on this <laughs> panel. Um, I think it's, it's very important to, to emphasize um, two points already been made by the other panelists. First of all, the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum is really um, an opportunity for regional cooperation. And I think it's very important to, to, to stress that um, Prime Minister Mitsotakis and President Anastasiadis and the foreign ministers repeatedly have invited Turkey and other members, uh, let's say other partners in the area to join forces with them in the Eastern Mediterranean gas Forum. I think that's very important. Now, secondly, um, the other important proposition, of course, let's go to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Why not? I mean, if there have been tensions all along and we can't agree, um, both, you know, um, Cyprus with Turkey and Turkey with Greece, why don't we go to the International Court of Justice? I mean, the Cyprus government has suggested this. The Greek government has suggested this. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a way forward of allowing mediation to take place under the auspices of international law and then abide, you know, by the, by the, by the decision. And then, of course, you know, that's a great confidence-building measure because then the leaders can say to their domestic audiences, guys, you know, you want, you know, 10 and we got five each, which is how compromises, you know, happen uh, um, in, in, in international settings. Um, and it's all under international law. So no disagreements there. It's a great confidence building measure. So I'll end on this on these positive uh, suggestions. Okay, uh, Mustafa. Uh, my question was out of the region, <laughs> uh, moving to the South Caucasus. But in fact, uh, of course, I can even argue to link South Caucasus to the Mediterranean uh, easily. But I'm not going to do it because it will conf even more confused region. Um, so looking to the South Caucasus, um, well, after so many years, uh, some sort of a, a militarily enforced solution is coming to the Caucasus. Uh, whether it's going to be durable or not, uh, it will depend on various developments and especially what will happen within Armenia uh, and how political situation within Armenia will uh, pan out. It will determine uh, whether the current um, stage uh, will continue. Uh, and let us not forget what was agreed was also uh, a ceasefire agreement. So it's not a peace yet. 
So it's a ceasefire agreement, and actually it's a phased ceasefire agreement, and first deadline is already missed. Uh, there was a deadline by, the, I think, 15th uh, for Armenia to evacuate some part of the territories that it was occupying uh, beyond the Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and it failed, and Russia asked Azerbaijan to allow another 10 days. Um, so we are already in the problematic aspect of the ceasefire agreement. Um, Turkey is not, of course, in the announced agreement ceasefire deal, uh, Turkish forces are not mentioned to be part of a ceasefire um, a peacekeeping operation, and, and they are not, not to be. Uh, however, it seems that there is some sort of an agreement uh, not fully announced uh, between Turkey and Azerbaijan and between Turkey and Russia uh, that some sort of a Turkish forces will be based in Azerbaijani territory to monitor whatever they are going to monitor. But they are not going to be in the Nagorno-Karabakh territory. Um, there is, a, of course, a, a very hot disputed discussion, hot, um, heated discussion internationally about who gained what in the recent uh, flare-up of the issue in the, co in the Caucasus. Uh, and uh, it seems that everybody agrees that Russia has been one of the biggest beneficiaries, apart from Azerbaijan, of course, regaining its territories. Uh, Russia has uh, managed a very difficult, very unmanageable situation very uh, easily and successfully, and has finally obtained permission of Azerbaijan to send Russian peacekeeping forces into the Azerbaijani territories, which it was trying to do since 1994 uh, and have failed so many times. So now uh, uh, Russia has an influence, heightened influence in Azerbaijan uh, and have heightened influence in the Caucasus. Uh, Azerbaijan, having um, uh, liberated its territories, of course, is another real uh, and big winner here. Turkey, uh, by that kind of a count, counting of the beans, seems not to be that much bigger winner. However, I would uh, add here that Turkey has been um, kind of absent uh, from the Cauc Caucasian uh, forefront for some years. Uh, of course, Turkish, Azerbaijani, and Georgian relations have been developing uh, quite successfully, and this trilateral cooperation are there. But apart from that, Turkey has been uh, kind of a, put Caucasus into the back burner because of the press, pressing issues in the uh, in the Middle East, in the in the South. And now, with this uh, moves in its recent moves and with this recent agreement. It seems that Tur we are going to see more Turkey in the Caucasus, maybe, the, maybe uh, involving more of the Caucasian issues and maybe involving more of the solutions uh, uh, of for some time, for some long-term issues. One aspect that I should mention not uh, gets uh, attention very much, the reason why Turkey uh, it closed its border with Armenia in 1994-1993 uh, was the occupation of Kelbeja region of Azerbaijan, which, is, which was very far away from the front line of the time. And now the Kelbeja is the first region that Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia is supposed to evacuate. Uh, if that happens, that removes the official Turkish uh, reason closing the border, the first instance. The secondly, uh, when Turkey and Armenia uh, uh, come up with two protocols to uh, reinvigorating their relationship and creating a rapprochement uh, back in 1999, uh, no, back in 2009, uh, the problem, uh, it failed, uh, and when it failed, Erdogan, who was prime minister at the time, said that Turkey would not normalize its relations with Armenia until the, uh, the occupation of Karabakh ends. So now it's ending. Uh, maybe this might give a boost, uh, an opportunity to 
re-engage Turkish Armenian, look into the Turkish Armenian relations. Uh, I would not, I'm not so uh, naive to think that it will happen now because especially the feelings uh, and sentiments is very high in Armenia currently against Ar Azerbaijan and, and Turkey. But maybe after a couple of years, now we might have a real chance of looking, going back to that, that, that kind of a discussion. Thank you. And maybe Mustafa, if uh, the uh, Greek Cypriot government asks Turkey to take the troops from Cyprus and then to Azerbaijan, you can even solve the uh, Cyprus issue. Well, I mean, um, let me mention, since you provoked me here, uh, let me remind everybody, it was in the Annan plan, there was an evacuation program for Turkish military from the island. Thank you. Well, I think some, some hundred should have stayed there. Was the yeah, hundred is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, if you see how close, 30, 000, you know. how close the Turkish border is, the military could come any time. So exactly. Again, exactly. Another issue. Dimitrios, uh, we have to round up. Uh, we need an optimist to round up and to show us into uh, the good future. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm not sure whether what I'm going to say is optimistic right now. Uh, <laughs> Anna did her part. No, two things very quickly, even just looking at the questions. The one by Maria Zaharaki and the Biden factor. I, I think that uh, other than, you know, more institutional relationships and relations coming up between the U.S. and all countries of the world, one has to consider one thing. And I think what's coming out of the Biden campaign and its people, and I think it's going to come out of the Biden administration, is for the U.S., and the West not to lose Turkey. And if it's about keeping Turkey in the West, I think this is something both Athens and Nicosia have to consider in the calculations. What does it mean? If this is the priority, how do we work with this? Because it doesn't have to be negative necessarily, but we have to consider this factor. And I think many of, uh, of Biden's uh, persons uh, that have had experience in the past, and many of his people, and would probably get administrative, uh, administration positions, uh, we'll try to do this, at least at first, to try to keep Turkey in the West. So we have to consider that. The second thing I want to, I mean, this is one of the questions in part of it by Stephanie Fankart, which had to do with, you know, the whole sanctions thing, Cyprus and Belarus. I mean, it's easy to accuse uh, Cyprus, which is a very small country in the EU, of I say compartmentalization of its foreign policy. Cyprus's possibilities are to look at an immediate neighborhood, right? First of all, it sees that its own territory, its own sovereignty is divided, and there's an issue there in terms of governance and final solution. And it also sees that, uh, you know, it sees a big Turkey, and it sees its partners in the, in, in the Middle East, and then it sees um, Greece. And so this is its focus. Many of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe that are accusing Cyprus of this are doing exactly the same. <laughs> They're doing exactly the same, of just focusing on the Belarus issue or the Russia threat, eh? so whether it's the Baltics or the Czech Republic or the Slovak Republic. So this is a reality that the EU itself, the big guys within the EU, better step up. The Germany and the France and the others and try to work to have, towards having a more cohesive EU foreign policy. Otherwise, these things will keep emerging. So accusing one side of trying to block the other which is exactly the reverse argument that the other side is trying to do anyway, is <laughs> not really helping the EU to step up as an actor that has the wherewithal, the tools, the ideology, the philosophy, an actor that won the Nobel Peace Prize for this in 2012, to do its share as a security guarantor with the instruments it has at its disposal. And, and so this is something we need to consider because otherwise it ends up being a blame game and it should not be that. But the reality is the EU is made up of small and very small states. And the problem with the small and very small states is that many times in their analysis, they cannot see the wider picture because they have to deal with the reality of the immediate threat that's out there. Even a country that's a medium state within the EU, Greece, it's a small state in the international arena. It's a medium-sized state, number 10, I think, in population. And, and an old member state that should... It's, it's caught up by this without trying to do a more a larger systemic analysis of what's happening. Because here we talked about Turkey in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. We just talked about, because there were questions, and Mustafa tried to explain what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh. We could have someone, there could have been a question about Turkey in Syria and Iraq and so on. We have to understand that larger context and how it affects us, as opposed to the argument, which is, it's very real, 
that Turkey is seen as a threat because it's, it's finding itself in, on the territories of other states violating the sovereignty, and therefore the perception, and it's using its power, its muscle, absolutely. But you have, we have to put that in a larger context to try to come up with, uh, with solutions uh, uh, that, that somehow uh, bring about a security community. Uh, and before I give the floor to you, Hannes, I'd like to thank you again for, uh, you know, this partnership. And I, it's the first time we actually work together on this, and we should think of doing this more often. Uh, I was also gratified of, at some stage we had over 100 people, whether it was both on Zoom and Facebook, watching simultaneously. And um, thank you very much. The floor is yours, Hannes. And, and you, to all the speakers. You. Dimitri, thank you, everybody. Anna, Mustafa, Mustafa Ahmed because I think that was a very interesting discussion. Of course, we didn't solve the issues, uh, but at least we got from Ahmed and all the others so some hints, some signs where the issue could go to. I think it is, uh, as Ahmed said, uh, more or less uh, the last chance to come to a solution. But with all the problems and all the interest of the different partners, it is, uh, I would say, it's mature to come to a solution because you can solve the energy issue and the Cyprus issue and the bigger role for Turkey in the region, but a role which is uh, compatible with the peace structure all at once. But, uh, you know, you need statesmen who think uh, wider than just uh, for their own nation, as Timothy said. Anyway, I don't want to start the, restart the discussion. Uh, Maybe, Hannes, let me just say something. Maybe uh, you need stateswomen. Huh? Well, Not well, only states, men. Even more, even more, even more. <laughs> but it's uh, so even in countries in Europe, it's uh, in European Union, it's very rare. And I look forward to the next, uh, to the first stateswoman in. In Ankara, which is uh, not easy to see, but anyway, why not? We well, have we, ha we had the first one, but with the prime minister, you have a prime minister. If she was so successful, is another issue we can doubt about. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, yes, it's women, so it's men, whatever. We need uh, people who look more into the future and not to the immediate uh, uh, future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you all the participants. As uh, was said, there were quite a lot. So you see, it's a, it's a big issue and it's a big interest here. Thank you and have a nice evening. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank all you very much. Bye bye.